Thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity to talk about our organization and the good work that we do. Um, my, uh, my role is the uh, Senior Legislative Affairs uh, Program Manager within the organization. And the Animal Legal Defense Fund is 40 years young. We've been around for 40 years based out of California. And uh, our mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. Most folks may know us uh, for our litigation program. That is certainly uh, how we made our mark. Um, but I'm so excited that the organization has made an investment in the legislative affairs program and we've expanded uh, to, to, again, expand our reach um, and uh, work on animal protection legislation. Sure, I, I would love to give you a broad overview of what's happening across the country. Um, and I think we have to naturally start with a conversation regarding the pandemic and COVID-19 and the impact that that's having not only on the human population, but the animal population as well. Um, a lot of our work has been stalled because state houses across the country closed at you know the beginning of the second quarter this year and that's primarily when legislature legislators uh and legislatures are in session and so um you know with those closings we we really didn't have a handle on the pandemic back in march and so a lot of our work was stalled. Some state houses just closed completely. Their sessions ended for the year uh, completely. But we've been able to pivot as well and uh, continue the conversation with legislators um, as we work through helping humans, uh, the human population, uh, while still recognizing that animal protection is a serious issue that you know, unfortunately does coincide uh, with the pandemic. And so, um, you know, a lot of our work has also been in transitioning, uh, empowering the public, providing webinars and uh, talking about uh, one in particular issue uh, at the federal level, the Tiger King and the Big Cat uh, Safety Act. And that's something that came out of, tragically, uh, out of this pandemic recognition on that issue because of the Netflix docu-series. Um, and so our team really was at the forefront in, uh, in working on a webinar uh, to engage legislators and the public to take action on that and recognize the issue of the animals uh, and not just sensationalize you know, some of the, the folks that uh, unfortunately run these, these facilities. And so um, there's been great success with that bill, it has actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at my cheat sheets as we're talking because there's so many issues we're going to be discussing. Um, there are 250 bipartisan co-sponsors on that bill, and that's pretty extraordinary. Actually, 264. I had an update earlier, and that's out of 435 representatives in the House and 100 in the Senate. This is at the federal level. And when you have that much support for an issue, it's shocking that something doesn't pass. So we're holding out hope uh, that this bill will be able to pass, if not this year, then in the next session. But this really recognition really came about because of, of the uh, pandemic. And um, yeah, and, and it's really unfortunate, but we're glad that we were able to right. capitalize on the opportunity to speak out for the animals. Yeah, and it seems like the the pandemic has brought up a few issues. You know, one of the things we were going to talk about tonight was um, the prohibiting of persons who had animal cruelty offenses from owning domestic animal companions. You also were going to talk about um, some issues relating to domestic violence. So I think both of those mm -hmm. kind of are relevant with with people being at home more, people maybe taking trying to take in animals more. Uh, maybe right. you could talk about those a little bit too. Sure. Well, I, I think to your last point, my goodness, shelters have been uh, have had extraordinary success with foster and adoption. So, if there's a bright light 
uh, because of all of us staying at home, working from home, this is it, mm -hmm. uh, that people are able to help companion animals. And uh, my goodness, what a, what a great problem to have. And that, again, benefits more of the, um, the smaller uh, organizations that perhaps are in greater need and they can partner with the larger shelters because they now have space so it's it's really a win-win for everybody um, in terms of the rise and the spike that we've seen in domestic violence um, one of our staff members had uh, uh, penned an article um, relating to the sequestration that you know we have the lockdown orders again uh, more towards the beginning of this year and because of that uh those domestic violence cases were up uh, you know folks that are in abusive relationships uh if they're going to be abusing humans they're going to be abusing animals and vice versa and so that's why we are such staunch supporters of cross-reporting bills uh, that's one area that we think that we can pro take a proactive approach towards addressing this issue by having states enact uh, mandatory veterinary reporting as well as interagency reporting. So those would be agencies such as uh, Family and Children's Services, elder uh, agencies, um, uh, you know, folks with uh, perhaps special needs. Uh, and if they have a caseworker going out checking in, on people again in these vulnerable communities if they suspect that an animal is, uh, is being neglected or abused they would be mandated to report that and in essence uh, that is protecting humans mm -hmm. because again of the link that we know between uh, human violence and animal cruelty oh that's great so th those two in particular I, kn I know you mentioned about the possession ban so mm -hmm. i'm happy to talk about that as well mm -hmm. and we've se we've seen an uptick in this uh also there's actually a bill in new jersey i i'm i hope that we can kind of touch upon certain bills in uh specific states so that your audience could recognize that it's not just uh, you know, one area of the country that is supporting and moving animal protection legislation, mm -hmm. it's a great swap across the country that we have, you know, opportunity to do this. And so these possession bans, um, in essence, would prohibit people that have been charged with criminal uh, uh, abuse from uh, owning an animal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think a big part of what we do is also recognizing that animal cruelty, animal neglect uh, in particular, oftentimes it's not, in many times uh, it, it may not be intentional. Mm -hmm. And mental illness is a, is a big part of what happens in hoarding cases in particular. We're not looking to punish people. Uh, we want people to get the help that they, they need that they require, and that's by professionals. Um, but we also never want to have an animal be put in harm's way. Mm -hmm. And there is a 100% recidivism rate when it comes to hoarding. So just you know, pulling out those animals, finding them a good home is not the answer. You have to address the root cause, which could be mental illness. So again, I think it's just uh, working hand in hand with other agencies. Um, and recognizing that not all of these um, issues are criminal uh, mm -hmm. abuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so as far as, um, you know, the philosophy of, and the sort of the mission of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, you know, I, what interested me is I've gotten your emails for years and I, you know, click and sign and, you know, try to, help with doing that you know sometimes you feel like you're not, it's not really doing much so i would get these emails from you all and i would you know click there were things to try to you know get attention from uh legislate to get legislation going for certain issues and so that always interested me about you all but then you know i saw some some things coming through about having advocates in court i believe and you know it just seemed like you all really had um sort of a bigger picture a deeper a deeper sort of philosophy about animals as sentient beings you know so i would love to hear more about you know just not, you are a legal so you have this legal aspect to your your foundation and your um the legislation piece 
but but you also have kind of this uh, to me that kind of aligns with with the whole idea of animal communication and understanding animals in a deeper level so maybe i could just let you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that sure and 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 i'm so grateful and so glad that you brought this up you know um let's take the legal system out of it common sense should prevail in this <laughs> in that we know animals are not property they are not uh in the sense that we normally think of a car uh, a tv um a, you know any inanimate object we know we all know anyone who has had or experienced an animal in their life knows that they have individual personalities every single animal we're, we're talking wildlife as well as farmed animal and companion animals um, and they are living breathing beings that can experience pain joy suffering fear um, and that's what we want to acknowledge and codify and just in the law just say that there's a distinction. They don't have to have human rights per se, mm -hmm. just a distinction to say that they are not a table, uh, but they are, they're not a human. If that's where the law is comfortable, you know, somewhere in between. And so what we're working on right now, uh, specifically, we're following the lead from Connecticut. And this was uh, uh, called Desmond's Law in Connecticut, which passed, uh, and subsequently in Maine, uh, a bill has also uh, become law, to enact a courtroom animal advocate program. We're calling them CAP, or CAPS, uh, for short, CAP bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, my goodness, actually, I'm, I'm going to turn this way because we have um, California, Florida, Illinois, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Texas. We had looked this year to uh, had comfort, have conversations in those states regarding moving a bill forward. Mm -hmm. And in New Jersey, uh, I think we're you know, poised to uh, have a hearing on, mm -hmm. on a bill that would allow licensed attorneys within the state and third year supervised law students become an advocate, just like there's a child advocate mm -hmm. uh, in, in the scheme of the law we were asking and we are asking for the same thing for animals so that there's someone there who could speak to their interest wow. the prosecutor has their job the defense attorney has their job who is there for the animal that's wow. what we're looking to do it's it's about justice you know we just want to make sure that there's justice for the animal and okay. so what's really exciting about the bill in new jersey I don't know if you can tell, I don't reside in California. I'm in New Jersey, so I have uh, at the top of my head that the knowledge base is, is New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, really grateful and really excited that we have such wonderful legislators in our state. Again, bipartisan uh, on both sides, mm -hmm. historically have been supportive of animal protection bills. Um, the courtroom animal advocate program bills have both been introduced by the judiciary chairs in the respective house we're bicameral so we have a senate an upper chamber and a lower the assembly mm -hmm. and both the assembly and senate uh, uh chairs for judiciary are the bill sponsors so we're really excited it passed through the full senate last year mm -hmm. uh, overwhelming bipartisan support we're hoping we're going to have the same um uh you know actions this year and uh we we know that this is something that is needed and our organization is committed to pursuing bills such as this. Yeah, that's terrific. That's wonderful. Um, you know, it kind of, it going back so many years, I used to work in, in the New York City foster care system as a social worker and would go to court and work with the attorneys who were representing the kids, but I would be in the homes and I would sometimes see that animals maybe weren't being treated as well. And there really wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't like an overt case of abuse, but they just didn't have anyone to speak to speak up for them and and for their well-being so mm -hmm. you know it's really wonderful to hear that this is actually you know something like that is going into hopefully going to be it would be wonderful if it became across the country but it's wonderful to see that it's it's really starting to pick up and get some attention um, and you mentioned and i'm kind of i don't mean to put you on the spot here um but i was wondering you know are you seeing anything where there's 
anything that's been held back that maybe perhaps with a new, uh, perhaps a new, <laughs> we're kind of in a weird place right now in November 2020-20, but um, in a, with a new um, president coming in or, you know, change, a lot of change going on, actually. What do you, mm -hmm. do you see anything that maybe has not been able to go forward or there's been concern in the world of animal welfare that maybe there's a hope now? Um, and, and don't worry if, you know, this wasn't something we necessarily prepared for, but it, it just came up as a question to me, yeah. if anything. Yeah. No, no. And I, I think it's a valid question because of where we are right now. And that's kind of, you know, we have results. We're in a holding pattern when the new uh, transition happens in, in January. Um, you know, what are, what are the results going to be then? Uh, and I think that's really going to determine the answer. Uh, to your question, I don't know that I can give a concrete answer right now because there are so many variables still at play. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important for everybody to know that no matter what, like for just to, I'll, I'll specifically answer your question first and then kind of go on a bit of a tangent uh, after, but um, there are certain bills that relate to farmed animal protection mm -hmm. that I think will have a better chance uh, because of the connection with climate change and sustainability and environmental de degradation and the intersection of whether it's uh, uh, socio uh, communities of, of a lesser socioeconomic means um, that live near these concentrated uh, feeding lots um, and there's you know just immense lagoons that are polluting the waterways and whether it's mega dairies with methane uh, uh, into the air I think that we haven't had the opportunity to, to meaningfully address the industry. Um, and I'm hoping that because of where we are right now, with recognition of our time, really kind of the clock is ticking on climate change. And if we don't look at some of the major um, uh, impactors, then we're, we're just, you know, dooming ourselves. And so, um, there is the Farm System Reform Act, mm -hmm. and that's something that I, I, you know, I'm not sure if there's going to be uh, complete traction on or not, but it would immediate, immediately prohibit uh, the creation or expansion of factory farms, and it would require, or during the pandemic, and it would require them to cease operation by 2040. Mm -hmm. And that would be significant because these large factory farms really do contribute uh, again, so much in terms of environmental degradation. And, you know, we have to just really be careful too when we're looking at how to mitigate carbon um, because there's a lot of talk about biogas right now. And I know it's it seems like we're kind of off the topic, but we're not. Everything is, is truly connected. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to biogas and, um, you know, dirty you know, industry, uh, uh, energy industries are looking to pump that, you know, methane from cows back into the soil and then pull it back out uh, for oil or gas. But then you're just bolstering this dirty industry and you're not actually uh, affecting climate change. So, you know, the answer is not to continue with farming uh, as we currently know it, but we have an opportunity to change the system uh, for our own health as well as the, the earth. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about what could be different when it comes to uh, companion animals and, and other issues, federal lands, uh, hunting, um, restoring the balance of nature, um, not allowing egregious practices uh, such as baiting and, uh, you know, the killing of, of wildlife bears in particular um, while they're hibernating. Like these are just atrocious uh, and, and really egregious practices that I think the vast majority of us don't approve of. If, you know, we don't judge what you're eating or, or if you are hunting, but these like hyper cruel mm -hmm. um methods are really what's so concerning because there's a detachment yeah. Yeah. Uh, from animals and yeah and I don't think that's um, good for any of us yeah absolutely yep yeah I mean that, and that is that speaks so much to just the whole 
philosophy of animal communication that, that animals do have thoughts, they have feelings, and, I, and, and I think what you're saying is so important, the more that we disrespect that and disconnect from that, it, it, it just seems to have some kind of an impact on who we are as people, even as we relate to each other. Um, and it's hard to even put your finger on that, why exactly that is, but it's probably a, a big, long other discussion for another show. But um, it, it does seem so important just to, just to, to human beings in general um, and how we relate to each other. So mm -hmm. the work that you all are doing is really, it's so broad. Um, you're covering so many different avenues, and I'm wondering, can you talk more about who who does all this work? Who <laughs> um, I know you have some volunteers, and then we're going to talk more about that too. But um, you know, tell us about that. How how do you structure all this? Sure. Well, again, the, the organization um, primarily known uh, for our litigation program, but we have a very robust criminal justice program as well. Uh, and those are the folks that um, will help legislators, prosecutors, uh, perhaps even speak with judges and, and other organizations, offering support, model language, et cetera. And then you have our, our um, legislative affairs program. And there are four of us that are covering the country. I wish it was a nice, neat split into quadrants, uh, quarters, but it's not. We're kind of uh, part and parcel across the country. Um, so we have folks that could um, speak to your audience in any state. And, and I think that's important. You referenced that earlier. Um, and then, of course, we have a designated uh, team member who covers federal affairs. But I, I, I also want to note that it's not just state and federal. Um, it's also at the local level, and that could nicely segue into kind of grassroots or uh, citizen lobbying. And I want people to know that, just as you mentioned before, with signing action alerts and, and emails, and it's all important, and it all makes a difference. And that's what we need more of for any constituent. And we hope you're a voting constituent. We hope you're you're uh, registered to vote because legislators will note that um, they should be speaking to any constituent. Um, but here's hoping that you're all registered to vote, uh, and and that then your voice becomes even more impactful, and you arguably have the uh, most sway with your legislator again as a okay. constituent and but that's also at the local level so your town your village your um uh, city i mean your your local council mm -hmm. or, or mayor and council if you can reach out to them any one of our bills basically have a um, an identical ordinance and so if you wanted to um support a ban on puppy mills or enact a ban on puppy mills at the local level to say, hey, my town, we don't want to have any uh, stores, any new stores built that will prop up the puppy mill industry. Mm -hmm. Reach out to us. We'll, you know, generate mm -hmm. some uh, um, model uh, language for you That's and great. walk you through it. So again, at the local level, it's way easier and, and it takes less time mm -hmm. to pass a resolution or an ordinance at the state level it could take a little bit longer don't be discouraged if it's a year or two mm -hmm. or four or yes. six it could take that long depending on your uh, legislature your representatives and your sessions and then at the federal level that is the hardest uh, because mm -hmm. it's like moving a mountain um, but we again are are grateful that we've seen some movement on on issues regardless of the administration um but certainly you know this we're we're we would like everybody to be active at le every level um and we have if you're a beginner uh, i had just done in may a lobby 101 uh which i'm happy to provide the link for that mm -hmm. um as well as like a 2.0 which is how to advocate for animals with or without a law degree and it just walks you through the basics. You would be surprised how easy it is and how quickly you could 
um, have your legislator initiate a, a dialogue with your legislator and or their staff um, mm -hmm. and move on issues. You know, okay. so uh, oftentimes it only takes a handful of residents okay. to become vocal and uh, your legislator may support an issue. That's great. It's wonderful that you have these resources. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we'll have uh, some of these links down below that we've, we've talked about some things here that would help people to, to have a direct link to your website and um, just more information. Is there anything that we have not talked about uh, that would be important to touch on? Yeah, actually, I hope you don't mind if I actually go through the list of bills. Um, I don't know yeah. the demographic of the folks that are on the call right now, but but I do want to kind of rattle them off again, mm -hmm. just to show that this is not an East Coast, West Coast thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got so many uh, uh, great legislators across the country and bills that are moving. Our, again, I should rephrase that because many legislators uh, legislatures are are done for the year but i do want to at least provide an overview of what we have worked on uh, and i think there's about six states that are either in special session right now or still in their their normal session um but animals used in research uh whether it's animal testing bans cosmetic sales bans we're working on that in massachusetts new jersey rhode island and vermont captive animals this would be circus bands in connecticut massachusetts and new york mm -hmm. uh, companion animal issues such as those puppy mill bands mm -hmm. uh, california massachusetts new hampshire new york okay. and new york the new york bill passed uh, halfway this year through the full senate so we're really looking forward to the next session which starts in january to move it over the finish line it, the bill has to be reintroduced but since it already passed through the full Senate last this session, uh, we only have halfway to go. So we're, we're excited about New York for next year. Um, the courtroom animal advocate program, I had mentioned all of the states before, mm -hmm. cross reporting in uh, Florida, New Jersey, and New York, mm -hmm. uh, possession bans, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Jersey, and farmed animals were part of a, a vast and robust coalition uh, on hen welfare and we've provided various levels of support in Massachusetts, Maine and Hawaii and we have had discussions to revive a New Jersey pig gestation crate ban uh, which we're hoping will pass this year and wildlife killing contests um, in Colorado, New Jersey, New York and Ohio. We're looking to move those as well as um, uh, oppose black bear hunts in New Jersey and Missouri. So that's the overview of uh, some of our issues, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions, um, any additional questions that you may have. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know the, the black, the, the bear issue in New Jersey is big. If you're not from New Jersey, you don't realize. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of bear debates. Yeah. Can I put a plug in for that, if, if I may? Um, yeah. Because we're so grateful to uh, Governor Murphy for publicly announcing that he will not approve a new black bear management plan in 2021 if it includes lethal methods. However, mm -hmm. the black bear hunt was expanded uh, from what was a one week hunt. It's now twice a year. And we've already had our October hunt. Okay. A new hunt, another hunt is coming up December 7th. Okay. And with the spike in COVID, the second wave happening uh, across yeah. the country, uh, really, but New Jersey uh, specific, there we're, we're looking at inviting 600 hunters into the state. And I think that's incredibly troublesome during this time. And the governor has the option to issue an executive order to suspend the hunt. We would encourage everybody to reach out to the governor's office. We actually have an action alert up on our website Please take action on that. Uh, whether you're from New Jersey or not, this could impact you as well. If you know some of the hunters come in and they um, inadvertently, you know, or, or with someone that has COVID, they could bring it back to your state. So uh, again, I just wanted to make mention of that because it's not a done deal, and and we still have a hunt coming up. Yeah. So if you are not from New Jersey, you can still reach. You can still advocate. You can still use the fill out the form online and 
Correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay. And Mm -hmm. you mentioned before, I'm kind of swinging back to something you said that when you fill out those online forms where they say, you know, I, I am concerned about X, Y, and Z, you know, please support this or that. You said that they actually know if you are a registered voter. No, well, they, they, no, 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 um, not when you send that, but oftentimes they may look up whether or not you're a registered wow. voter and who you are. Um, they'll oftentimes check to make sure that you're a constituent. So uh, huh. the staff members may ask for your address. Um, and if you supply that, you know, then then they can. I mean, it's the time of very little. Uh, privacy so (laughs) everything is easily uh, traceable but but I I really do want to emphasize the point that um, your voice is heard and and I truly hope that people Mm -hmm. will take action we cannot do this alone we rely on constituents on people that are on the ground in the state um, that are voicing their concerns and so um, it would be awesome if anybody has interest in any of the the issues that we talked about to reach out to us and we can walk you through the steps uh, on how to engage your legislator and get active on any of these issues. I'm the eternal optimist and I feel like you never know. You just right. never know Absolutely. Yep. if that one phone call is going to make the difference. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Wonderful. And another way you can, you know, help out here is to share this, let other people know about this interview, you know, put this out here in, you know, share it to different mediums, you know, share it to um, different social media outlets, email, you know, there's different ways to get people to watch. And, you know, you can play a role just in simply doing that. So, you know, is there anything else that we have not touched upon that I have missed? Well, I'm not sure if everybody knows who we are, so please go to our website. It's yes. aldf.org, <laughs> O-R-G. Um, and I'm just going to, oh, I'm going to turn this way. As you can see, all of our clients are innocent. Oh, and I just yes. wanted to emphasize that point um, because animals truly are the innocent ones. And uh, we need to be their voice since they cannot speak out for themselves. So um, I thank you so much for this opportunity Uh, and and platform to talk about the good work that we do and uh, welcome working with uh, everyone else who shares this interest. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And, you know, as usual, you can always reach me. My website is intuitivetouchanimalcare.com or directly at Anne with an E at intuitivetouchanimalcare.com. Rub my belly. Rub my belly. Rub my belly.